Hello and welcome back to the new episode of the Elias Moreira podcast. Today's episode is with a very special guest. His name is Zach Michael. He is a mindset coach for entrepreneurs. And uh, he's been my mindset coach for the past almost two years. And it's been great working with him together. And I decided to take him onto this podcast because a lot of the topics that he's uh, specialized in, in mindset, are very also relatable to us musicians, to the music industry. Because, I mean, in the end, we are all humans and our mindset and our mental health is really our greatest asset and also our most important thing that we need to take care of. And Zach just helped me so much in the past year to really overcome my my daily challenges and my self-doubts and help me to just become a better human and live up to my potential. And I'm very happy that he's here on this podcast. So I really hope you enjoy this next few minutes where I speak with him. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. This is the Elias Moreira podcast. Here we discuss classical musicianship, what it means to be a musician, the lifestyle, and how to overcome the daily challenges that every young musician has to face within this highly competitive industry. Enjoy. Okay, so yeah, Zach, um, how how are you doing? Very well, thank you, brother. How are you doing, Elias? I'm great. I mean, the the weather here in, um, in Belgium is shit as always. I don't know how is it in uh, in Vancouver. You're there right now as well, right? In Vancouver, yeah, it's beautiful, man. We have uh, really nice spring and summer, yeah. so it's nice. We lucked out with the weather. I I really would like to to come visit you there once or, or, or like just travel also my girlfriend she really loves uh, canada for some reason she really would love to i think it's because of the nature you have amazing nature there right and, and especially in the uh west coast right yeah you got it exactly Ton we have uh, we have everything from mountains beaches snow you can snowboard you can do it all oh nice so you have an open invitation man oh cool and and you You were born in uh, in Vancouver. Yes, but you like to, you like to to travel though. And and have you been to Europe before? Oh yeah, yeah, several okay. times. I love to travel. I love Europe. I can't wait to get back to Europe, especially Belgium. I've never seen Belgium. Yeah, it's okay. It's it's an it's nice, but there are definitely more beautiful places in this world than Belgium. I would, in my opinion, I would say. There, there are nice things here. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure it has its strengths. Yeah, but yeah. I, there's great beer here. I don't know if you if you like beer or you don't drink at all. No, no. I, I, I'll look. If I'm in Belgium, I'm drinking beer, man. There's no question. I'm eating waffles. I'm eating chocolate. We're doing beer the whole th the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, it's so so funny. The the food here, right? It's, it's so unhealthy, but still, people are not really like they look all quite fit here. If you compare it to United States or something. That... Yeah, I think it has to do with like quality of ingredients. You know, I think the EU has probably like higher standards in, in many ways in terms of like, um, you know, ingredients of, and just food. Yeah. So and maybe moderation. Maybe people are eating. Small yeah, portions. That, that could be. And I think they also do a lot of sports here because, you know, it's very flat. So everyone is cycling a lot on the i mean especially the flemish side because there is um yeah belgium is very complicated with the uh, politics and this the, it's like half speaking french half speaking flemish which is like kind of dutch and then there's still a tiny portion of german and the french speaking and and the dutch speaking side they really don't like each other it's a bit like canada actually <laughs> it's the same no Really? Oh, you mean the French Canadian yeah, and, and the, the rest the English of speaking? Is, is there a big like fight between them or not at all? Or how is that? No, it's probably just like a playful kind of uh, disdain, yeah. you know? Yeah, Canadians <laughs> are just nice. No, I think it's, it's, it's all, it's all in good fun. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's that serious, but um, I didn't know that about Belgium actually. So there is kind of like that separation. Yeah, between and it's them. very heavy it, and it's getting much bigger. The, the, the separation is, becoming much uh, wider um mm. but i think like everywhere in this in the world right now right everyone is 
it's the polarization is getting really huge in all spectrums. But actually, I, I wanted to ask mm. you if you are into like classical music and is there like how how is the classical music scene in in Vancouver? Do you have any references or something like that? Uh, you know, I, I would say that I'm definitely I definitely have an interest in classical music, but not to the extent that I can, you know, reference like it from a ho historical perspective or, you know, definitely like an amateur yeah. interest. Um, we have a small scene yeah. in Vancouver, um, but I, I have a great respect for classical music, yeah. you know, uh, classical music really, you know, as we're going to most likely get into mindset and things like this, classical music calibrates it measures very high in terms of consciousness spiritual consciousness mm -hmm. vibration right it has a, a very high vibration generally speaking so i know that when i listen to classical music i tend to feel good it 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 um it tends to to boost the mood and it tends to just evoke emotion mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. actually really interesting because i want to you know composers for example i don't know Chopin and Schumann and like very famous composers they wrote the most beautiful kinds of pieces of art which how you say vibrate on a very high level but themselves they were miserable like Schumann ended his life in a in a psychiatric, psychiatric uh, asylum and Chopin was depressed his whole life and I want I wonder why is that why even though they create pieces of art that are such that are so beautiful and calibrated on such a high level of love and bliss and then they are so miserable mm -hmm. you can you explain maybe like from your perspective what why that is yeah it's a good question i think there's a level of mysticism around it it is somewhat mysterious you know um because i think also too you know when i say that generally or maybe a lot of classical music calibrates high vibrates high also some of it will vibrate lower but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing right because in general it evokes emotion yeah. but that could evoke a wide range of emotion and i think that's just part of the beauty of the genre of music it's like life right it's not only one way like some other genres are where if you look at like a lot of Uh, modern music, like, con like contemporary, like hip hop, rap, it's generally there, there's kind of like one stream of consciousness yeah. or vibration that you might feel when you're listening to um, modern music in that way. But when you look at classical, there's a wide range. It can evoke passion. It can evoke um, fear sometimes. Oh. It can evoke beauty, bliss, sadness. And so I think You know, that's what I noticed the most about classical music is that it, it can really connect you with a wide variety of emotion. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like um, that that lower emotion is just always negative because you get to experience this fluctuation and there's beauty in the fluctuation. Yeah. But to go back to your question about like, how could you look at, let's say, a composer that was maybe depressed all their life or they ended their life in a this kind of dramatic way um, from what I've heard is that a lot of these masters, when you look at masters, a lot of them seem to attribute their masterpieces to like divine guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's like when they're in some kind of state, maybe like a dreamlike state or some kind of altered state of consciousness, it's as though the music is being written through them and they're like a vessel. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, maybe, you know, maybe a composer's in a lower state of mind, but in that moment of inspiration, there's like a higher realm being connected with. And through that connection comes this masterpiece. I also like... For, for example, also like us musicians and um, humans in general, we we have so much difficulties to to get out of negative of negativity, right? We always uh, wh why is it so difficult for us to be happy? That's a like very deep question. 
why is it for, for example i notice in myself sometimes that you know i'm going through my day and i go practice and i do my daily tasks and stuff and there's oftentimes like this this buzz you know this um subtle uncontentment subtle unhappiness like just following me the whole day and it's not always like that but oftentimes you know if i'm long time uh, going through my day and it's always the same very routine oftentimes I, i found myself also in the past and also sometimes today where i just feel this constant subtle unhappiness and i think a lot of musicians can relate to that they oftentimes you know every time i ask them how are you doing they always say oh, i'm tired or i'm stressed or something like that why is it so difficult for for us to just overcome this and and and, and just be more happy as, as humans well i think you if, what can give us a clue here is if we look beyond just the field of um Uh, of professional music, right? And we look at all different types of artists, right? We can we can look at um, you know any type of fine artist, but people who are painting, creating these masterpieces, people who are even comedians. Yeah. It's an art yeah. form. It's all different forms of right brain expression, yeah. right? This is the commonality. And so, if someone who is um, naturally inclined towards artistic expression, that most likely points to they're going to be ha they're going to have more of a relationship to their right brain consciousness and the right brain consciousness is where we find emotion so if you if you look at someone on the opposite end of the spectrum who's more let's say they're in they're in a professional field that requires left brain functionality we typically associate these types of people with less of a connection to like a wide range of emotions or maybe they're just kind of a more it, they they may appear as more emotionally stable mm -hmm. right and it's just it kind of points to the field they're in because it's using more of their left brain intelligence and in the right brain it's all about emotional expression so i don't see it as though it's like i just see it as a consequence of being more in the right brain if you're more in the right brain you're just going to have more of a connection to emotionality in general which includes that full spectrum mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this spectrum, right? Um, you, you in your in your coaching in the beginning, you always teach us the foundation of of reality, basically, right? You, the, you, you have the scale of consciousness, and for example, as we said in the beginning, classical music vibrates on a very high level. Can you just because you 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 taught it? To me you explained to me how this scale works but for some people that might never heard of this can you tell a bit about what what the scale is what are levels of consciousness how does it how does this work what is a level of consciousness yeah good question a level of consciousness is another way of saying a level of emotion mm -hmm. and we have a range of those emotions that any human can experience throughout any moment in their life. And so this, this map of consciousness or this map of human emotion, you might say, ranges from the lowest level of measured consciousness, which is shame at the level of 20. Now there's a, there's a numbering scale along this map and the numbering scale is just there to give us um, an understanding from a um, numerical perspective of like, where is each level in terms of, we just give it a number so we can have an easy reference, oh, shame, 20. And above that, guilt, 30. And then we go all the way and we keep going up in this scale till we reach a critical, very important point in this scale. And this is the level of 200. So from 20 up to 200 we have the emotions that are considered the emergency emotions these are when we are in some level of um, fight flight or freeze you know so it's not we're not at peace we're not relaxed so we're in some type of emergency emotion so we've got fear we've got anger we've got pride apathy and so on and then at 200 um, we have, if we cross 200, that's the critical threshold between these emergency emotions 
and the welfare emotions. Welfare meaning now I can care about other people. I can look beyond just myself and my own survival, and I can start to look and look at others and consider others' welfare and well-being. And so above 200, we have courage is that very first power-based level of consciousness, and it goes all the way up to the level of 1,000, which would be pure consciousness. And this is at 1,000, we have the, the, the great sages and spiritual avatars throughout human history, such as uh, Christ, Buddha, Krishna, a lot of these kind of very famous spiritual leaders throughout history have calibrated at the very peak, the very pinnacle. I, I read somewhere, I don't, I, I think it was uh, in the book I read uh, about the uh, art actually from Rick Rubin, I, I, I told you, you um, for you to get it. Um, and it said that, People like um, like Christ or Buddha, they are remembered until today, not because of what they did, but because of the level they calibrated. Right? I, like, I th I think you can uh, like big moments in history, like for example, Jesus um, and Buddha. These kind of personalities, they are so famous. They're most influential people in the whole world and the whole history of humanity because of the level they calibrated, right? Is that like one of the, the, the reasons you could explain why they are so remembered, why they are so famous? Yeah. And, and I think that it's not only who they were and their level of consciousness, but that will also connect directly to what they did as well, because this is what we attribute like, a lot of the kind of miracles that are associated mm -hmm. with Jesus or um, these various figures, right? So they also did things that were miraculous and therefore stood the test of time. We remember them yeah. throughout history, throughout time. Yeah. <laughs> We are already going like so deep, <laughs> like completely away from, <laughs> from music instead of like spirituality and stuff. But that's, uh, that's actually what interests me, right? I, I'm very into trying to figure out who I am and what my purpose is of being here. And I think playing music oftentimes is a way of me expressing who I am and a lot of musicians and, and people that listen to music also, because for example, my brother, he's not a musician, but he listens to music all the time. He, he likes to all, all kinds of uh, genres and by him listening Music, I think he's like the most happy person when he listens to music. And why why is that music has such a powerful impact? That's also like a question that I oftentimes ask myself. You know, when I when I watch a great movie or or when I when I listen to music, yeah, let's say I listen to also all kinds of genres, but specifically classical music there's just something that oftentimes create goosebumps. I, I, I get goosebumps very fast from classical music. With other genres, not so much. It can happen as well. But classical music every time, depending on what I'm listening, does this also have to do with the... Why, why does this happen to me? I, I, I ask myself, is it because of the level of consciousness where the piece was written? Or is it just a natural biological thing that happens with us? Yeah, I think that the, a piece will calibrate at a level. You know, you can think of, for example, let's take it in a different context. If you look at a movie, another expression of art, which includes music, some kind of score, right? If, it, if you're watching a negative movie, let's say you're watching a horror movie, most likely you're not going to feel good watching that movie. You're going to be scared. Right. It, it'll invoke different types of lower those emergency based emotions below 200. And so but why? Because of the content of that piece of art, okay, of that movie, it just vibrates. It's just all vibration. Think of it in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. So it vibrates at that. You then take it in through your eyes, through your ears and whatever else you're taking it in through that we're not aware of. And then it adjusts, it attunes your energy field 
to the energy field of the content that you're watching. And so I see it as the same as music. You just, you, you give your attention to any level of consciousness for long enough and it will start to influence yours. It's like a, it creates like a, a vibrational resonance. And then you start kind of resonating with whatever you're giving your attention to. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And uh, you, you listen to classical music, uh, or, or you, what, what kind of music you listen to from time to time? I, I go through phases, right? Well, I used to go through phases where I would only listen to one genre for like years. And then for some reason, I would just shift. Like I'd go for like electronic music, like house music, electro, progressive house, things like this. And then I would just switch back to rap. And then I may switch to classical. And then I kind of go through these phases. Nowadays, it's more of a mix of all of them. And it just depends on the mood I'm in. But also like, I, I wonder, because a lot of really great musicians that are a lot of that, that just play amazingly well. Oftentimes they're not, they're not quite well in, in their head, you know, they're, they're a bit crazy. Like there's one pianist, very famous already died. Um, his name was uh, Glenn Gold. He was Canadian, I think, by the way, Glenn Gold. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think he was Canadian and he was the most crazy guy ever. Like he brought his own chair to the concert halls. He had a carpet that without it, he couldn't play. He was like always sitting with like, like uh, in the Lord of the Rings, the guy, what's his name? Um, they said, my precious, you know, this guy, Gollum. Yeah. So he looked like that and he just played so beautiful and he played amazingly well. And sometimes I ask myself, do you need to be crazy to be a good musician? You know? Why why is it like this? I don't understand. Because, you know, a lot of times, uh, that's not just him. Like, there's so many other famous, really good musicians that are all a bit, like, messed up in their head, you know? Uh, like, composers as well. Great composers were all a bit crazy. And I think you, somehow, you need to, to be really great at something. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even need to be, like, music. If you... If, if you really want to like go on to the next level, you need to be really obsessed about something, no? Like you need to be, it, it needs to be your life. It needs to be everything. And for me, it, it doesn't resonate for me because I want to have a balanced life. I, I want to do classical music, but at the same time, I also like to um, have, I have a lot of other interests as well. And, so I wonder how can I really become a master at something, but still stay balanced and not like, uh, not just hustle and work all the time and, and, you know, till three in the morning practicing, but like have a stable, healthy life, but still achieve greatness, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at a lot of these masters from years, all, all throughout time, a lot of, you know, today in this modern day, we have more awareness than we have in recent history about human health, what the mind and body requires for, for balance and vitality. And so I think we could probably chalk up a lot of ill health to just a lack of awareness, a level of ignorance of what does the mind, body, and soul require to maintain health, right? So if you look at it today, you could say, okay, I want to go in and I want to become a master in my field. I want to tap into my highest degree of potential while not sacrificing my mental, physical, emotional health. And so then it just requires, you know, how can I look at maintaining that health and what other things can I do mm -hmm. to ensure that I don't sacrifice my health in these ways while still tapping in to my full potential and developing mastery, right? Yeah. The, you know? the Because to achieve mastery, we we oftentimes compare ourselves to, to people that already have mastery. Um, we always look up to people we want to be like and we, we kind of idealize them. But... At the same time, this kind of comparison really creates a lot of self-doubt within myself and other musicians. Like, we, I see that in musicians a lot. We are all very self-critical. 
and we have so much negative self-talk about what we are doing. We are not good enough and uh, we need to practice more. And after a concert, ask any musician. They're never really, really happy. They're never content. Like, yeah, I played amazing. They never say that. They're always like, it's not good enough yet. Um, wh Why do we always self-sabotage ourselves? This This voice, how can we... How can we become more aware of this voice? How can we tackle that voice and and stop being so negative about ourselves all the time? Self doubt. How how do we stop this? Hmm. Yeah, it's a big question. I think you know part of it will depend on the individual. What is the nature of their particular form of self sabotage? Some people, it'll be there's going to be a voice in their head. It'll be very audible. It'll be a lot of self talk. Other people, it may not be as much audible and self-talk. It may be just more feeling and they may not really hear a conversation going on in their, their minds. And they just may be prone to kind of experiencing a certain type of emotion. But if you look at what you described is that what's a common pattern? A lot of musicians, despite their level of skill, are still very self-critical. And we say, well, that's just like, you know, unnecessary, this, this type of, you know, being overly critical of oneself and ability is just completely unnecessary. But at the same time, uh, there's a silver lining because if, if you're always kind of going, I could do better, I could do better, I could do better. You will do better. Most likely if you're saying I can, and I need to, I, I will seek to, then you'll find a way to do better. So it could, the answer could be, um, yeah, find just more of a balance with being, okay, I can do better. How could I always improve? I think that's what a lot of masters are not losing sight of. They're saying, how can I always improve? And it's because they don't stop at, at attaining a higher level of mastery that they just keep getting better and better and better. So I think we could find maybe a balance, right? It's not to say, well, I'm never going to um, look at myself or my skills in this, in this kind of intense way again. I still need to be aware of how I can improve and do better naturally but maybe I could find some kind of balance with not being so uh, judgmental in a negative way. Like, yeah, how can I do better? I'm always doing, for example, I'm always doing the best I can. And how can I do even better? So it's like having an awareness of the fact that I'm doing the best that I can. So we don't just fall into self-condemnation and not have this kind of um, overly critical like you got to own your wins. You got to own your success, right? You got to own mm -hmm. it at the same time. Go, I'm always seeking and striving to do better. So that's what I would look to do is I would look to find a balance with that, mm -hmm. not to completely resolve it and go, Oh, I'm never going to think this way again. No, there's a silver lining there. There's some value there, but how can I also celebrate my wins? How far I've come so along this journey, mm -hmm. right? Just to balance that out. But I think, you know, at least to answer your question, I think that there's there's going to be any number of reasons as to why people self-sabotage. But I'm looking at more so how. How are you doing it? Are you are you saying negative things? Are you speaking negatively about yourself? That's why I would look for balance. If I'm always speaking negatively about myself, then that's what I'm giving more of my attention. And that's what I'm energizing. So I would say, look, like I said, I'm winning. I'm succeeding. I've come so far. Let's keep going. Let's do more. Yeah. Yeah. Th th that is so tricky to find out uh, because we don't really pay attention to what is going on in our minds. We, we never, most humans don't really pay attention to what is going on in their mind. They're just feeling the emotion. They're, they're thinking, but they're not aware of what they're thinking. They're not aware of what they're feeling. And I, I, I see this with myself oftentimes, like the, my, my ego is so clever as, as soon as I spot myself thinking, ah, I'm thinking about this. Ah, okay. Okay. Elias, you're, you're aware that you're thinking negatively. Okay. It's fine. And like two seconds later, I'm already in it again. It's, it's, it's so difficult to, to stay in a, to, to stay hyper aware all the time especially if you're not used to it, I guess you can practice it through meditating and through, through, yeah, through, through coaching and stuff. But 
uh, I see this with myself. I, I really have struggles in staying alone and quiet with my thoughts. I always look for a distraction. I always, either if it's work, practicing, because sometimes I use practicing to get away from my thoughts. You know, I, I practice long hours because I don't want to think. I don't want to be alone with my with my thoughts or social media. You know, oftentimes I'm waiting for a practicing room at a university because there's a limited amount of rooms. So we students, we always have to, to put ourselves on a list and, and then we wait until we get a room. And I notice everyone around me is always on their phone scrolling uh, through social media because they just can't just sit there like a human and do nothing. We We can't really just stay quiet and not do anything. And I, I wonder why, why is it so difficult for, for us to, to just sit there and do nothing without getting distracted. Like for me, the most challenging thing at this point right now in my life is really to be able to be happy while doing nothing. I, I would celebrate a win so heavily if I could just sit down in my bed one day for five hours without doing anything and just, and still be happy, not like overthink every time and just be happy just sitting there. How can someone get, get there? How, how can I become happy with doing less? It's more or less like this, the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the first part of this where you were describing the fact that it seems like, most people today cannot really sit still and just be in stillness or, or be without some kind of something taking their attention. I think for the most part, we've just become accustomed to distraction. We've become accustomed to being overly stimulated. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this baseline of stimulation has changed over time because now we have access to so much stimulation through our phones, through social media, through everywhere. It's online. It's if we can't get away from it. So now the game is how do we, how do we consciously step away from it so we can change that baseline into more peace, more stillness as a more natural way of being in the world. So I think one way, you know, when you think about you saying, okay, there we are. And you look around, you see everyone's on their phone. They can't just like sit and wait with their own mind. What the way I look at this is leaning into it, leaning into what we are avoiding. So if you ask yourself, why is someone stuck on their phone? Most likely they don't need to be, let's say they're just kind of killing time. Is there something that they're avoiding by being just stuck on their phone, being engaged in some form of stimulation. Is there something you're avoiding? Let's say if you were to put the phone down and just sit in stillness, would that be uncomfortable? Now it may be uncomfortable for the average person and for some more than others. But the way, so the way that I would look at it is that I would challenge myself to embrace or lean into the stillness um, to this moment of stillness that the average person is wanting to avoid or evade because why? Well, let's say there's some kind of underlying fear. Let's say this is boring. And so if it's boring or if there's some kind of underlying fear, I'm then going to say, well, look, if I want to improve this, then I have to lean into it and I have to really practice becoming comfortable with the stillness, with this space. And I have to actually confront the boredom, confront the fear, confront the challenge of generating a, a one pointedness, a stillness in my mind. Right. And I just think it comes down to leaning into that, which we feel like we need to avoid or distract ourselves from. If we can't um, be okay with being just still and not being distracted for five minutes, I think that's a problem. I think this is like indicating a real kind of underlying situation here. Yes, it's actually, unfortunately, more normal today, but it doesn't mean it's okay yeah. or right or beneficial. So I think we got to go, okay, um, this is critical for me to enhance the overall quality of my life. If I need to set being still for five minutes as a real measurable goal for me, and I just need to lean into it. If I confront boredom, 
that's what I need to embrace. If I can confront fear, that's what I need to embrace. So just look at it though, as though this is a challenge. Normally I would evade, avoid. Why? Because we don't want to experience a fear, right? We're always looking to seek comfort, but we grow through challenge. So if I can just say sitting in stillness for five minutes is a challenge and that's one that I'm willing to embrace, then good. Sit there for five minutes, even one minute. Notice how long you can get. Notice how long you can go for. And then just embrace the boredom. Embrace the stillness. Oh, my mind's get, dis, getting distracted. Watch the thoughts of the mind. Think of it like a little moment of meditation. Yeah. And just do it piece by piece, step by step. Chip away at it. The, the way I do it, I every time I do something, I try to do one thing at a time. So when I when I eat, I just eat. I don't watch movies or because oftentimes I, I would take my phone, you know, and watch YouTube videos while I'm eating my cereal. But I try to do one thing at a time. Or when I commute to to my university or if I'm walking somewhere. Sometimes when I feel good and I want to like listen to something to some music or, or or audiobook or something i do it but i try to do it only when i feel like i'm doing it out of a right reason like i'm inspired to listen to it not to escape the to the the stillness so when i feel like i want to escape the stillness while i'm walking somewhere i don't listen to anything i just really try to just walk and go the way i have to go and uh yeah also decrease my my phone my screen time in general i i used to have a lot of screen time on my phone now I, it's so, some weeks it's even below one hour so it's great on my phone i try to really tone it down but on average it's around one fi 150 two hours something like this but for me that's already a great improvement i try to really reduce screen time and yeah, and, and like live a more simple, minimalistic life. Also, because you once told me that I should really be aware in every mundane uh, situation. If I if I if I'm washing the dishes, I try I try to be really aware. Okay, I'm washing the dishes right now, and I try to just stay in the present moment. And and uh, and I think it makes me more calm. It it it. it it reduces anxiety because if you're always suppressing what you're feeling, it just becomes bigger and stronger. And, and yeah, I think that's, that's a, a good way for me to start at least to, to become more um, comfortable with stillness. I, I wonder how, how does your, like normally on a normal day, how does your routine look like? during the day what do you do how does it look like <laughs> i keep it pretty simple um you know i start out with coffee on the patio oh i miss i, I need one man i need a balcony this is like the number one thing if i when i will change the place i need a balcony or terrace or anything it's, sure it's so this yeah it's, it's good even if it's shitty weather if you are outside it at least feels a bit better than if you're just inside all the time this is it. I want to have a connection to fresh yeah. air. And um, so I just, we have a, the, it faces like this patch of forest. And so we just have our coffee in the morning and we just look at green. We look at forest and it's just a moment of connection, connecting with that vibration. Cause it's all about yeah. vibration, right? Connecting with that higher energy of nature, having a moment of stillness, you know, it's not like a heavily engaging moment mentally. It's just peace, quiet, connecting with nature, starting the day with a connection to a higher energy, a higher vibration. And, uh, and then I just, you know, we do some reading usually, and then I'll start my coaching sessions with clients, whether that be a group call, one-on-one -on -one call. And then I usually fit in, uh, some exercise. So I'll go to the yeah. gym. Right. And then I keep it that simple. So I'm just, to me, you know, when I, I used to be stacking as many different things as I could into like morning routines and things like that. But I found that less is more. Mm. So I've just found that if I can commit to certain things that are very simple and have a meaningful impact for me, to me, that's valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Th that's 
what I want to do as well, like make my life a bit more simple. Because also, um, do you, you, you coach people for your own program, right? And then you coach also for, for other business owners, you help them with their clients, with their mindset as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what are, like, is there any, I know we are like getting super away from, from music, but I think this is still relevant for us musicians. When we look at other um, industries, in the end, the problems they come with to you, like the questions they have, it's always, it doesn't matter in which industry you are, right? It's always the same. It's actually everything is, all the problems always stem from, from lower consciousness. So it's actually always from the same source. Or more, or if I can say it like that. Um, and these these people, um, it, for, for you, like, do you see yourself oftentimes with the the same problems that they come to you? Do you recognize yourself as well? Sometimes that you had the same things that you struggled the same as they are struggling. Is this something that you can oftentimes relate to? I guess yes, right? Most definitely. That's the big part of the reason why I'm in the field that I am because I've gone through my own experiences of self mastery, right? That's mostly what I teach is self mastery. And as it relates to whatever anyone's main goals or concerns are, whatever their industry is, it always come back, comes back to mastering oneself, mastering the darkness within whatever that darkness is. And we can look at what that is, but um, yeah, I've had my own personal experiences with that and I needed to, find resolution, find inner peace. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big part of the reason why I'm on this journey that I'm on and helping others is because I've walked my own pathway and I still am to this day, of course, you know, but when you, you say, uh, you said before, despite the, the field, the profession, it's usually an example of the, whatever their issue is, it's usually kind of, there's a pattern there with everyone. And we found that there's there's really six core wounds throughout humanity. Uh, repression, one is repression, where we're just kind of unwilling or or unable to, um, or unconscious of our wounding, so we don't want to go there. We don't want to look. It's like an avoidance pattern. And another one is denial, mm -hmm. a lack of response, not taking responsibility, and from denial comes. A behavioral pattern of accusation, right? Placing responsibility upon another. Another wounding pattern is shame. Shame is another one. Remember, shame is at the bottom of the map of consciousness. And another uh, core wounding pattern throughout the collective is rejection. Everyone is carrying some, and we all carry uh, all elements of these, but in just kind of various amounts. Wow. Some people will tend towards more rejection than others. Yeah. So rejection is one of them. Uh, guilt is another one. And then finally, separation. Separation. This kind of belief, this feeling like we're all separate from one another. We're separate from source, from wherever we came. We're separate. We're separate. We're separated. We're isolated. Yeah. And so when we're looking at any of these kinds of behavioral patterns, wounding patterns, they're, they're usually going to connect to one or more of these types of core wounds. Uh, that's, we always have the yeah tendencies to something. For me, it was fear. I had a lot of fear. That was like my tendency. The mo like I didn't really had the struggle with rejection and um, or guilt or something like that. I mean, yes, like you said, there are certain levels of that I that I experienced. But for me, the strongest was fear by the way i just have to charge my laptop before it dies <laughs> one second yeah so for me it was always like uh fear and um fear of the future and that's something you actually really helped me with i i, I got so much I, i got rid of my strong anxiety because because of uh, the work with you and i think a lot of musicians actually can benefit so much from from what you do so if 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 they were to look you up and and try to reach you to maybe work with you 
what, what is the best way to to get in touch with you yeah you can find me on uh, at self mastery accelerator.co okay. I mean, I, will, I can put it also in the description later and also your, yeah. your Instagram maybe is the best way to reach you. Instagram is good as well. Mr. Zach Michael, Mr. Dot Zach yeah. Michael. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, less is more. Let's keep it for now until here. Um, maybe, you know, in the future, if people really like this episode, we can make another one and talk more. But... Uh, I think it was really, really insightful. And also like, it was like another session, therapy session for myself as well. So again, like wake, uh, yeah, get my mindset straight. Um, yeah, Zach, thank you very much for, for joining this podcast episode. You're my first guest, by the way. <laughs> Man, it is an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me as your first yes. guest. And man, Ilias, uh, you're going to do great things in this field. Yes in the field of music and for so many other people as well. Yeah. I hope I can do my best and uh, yeah. Thank you again for being on this show and um, I'll, uh, we'll see if you join another time next time. Sounds good, brother. I look All forward. Right. Be well. <laughs>